of the inclusion uh, workers for the labor force, uh, government agencies as developmental states, which invest in infrastructure and knowledge, and business corporations, uh, which are as innovative enterprise invest in value creating process and processes. And then as kind of micro foundations, which I go through a little bit in the paper, uh, you have an inter interactions of these organizations. Now, one point is that these are organizations, not markets. So a lot of the arguments that I make as a critique of economics, as a need for alternative, is that economics is about how organizations operate and interact within institutional contexts, and markets are outcomes. So what economists have say, see as the source of a, a well-working economy, a well-functioning economy, is actually an outcome. And in fact, if markets are taken on a life of its own, uh, they can undermine the organizations uh, that uh, um, uh, actually invest in productivity and also the ideology of the market uh, tends to undermine uh, those organizations. And one of the ideologies that I've been focusing on since the mid 80s, uh, which I'll talk about today, is the ideology of maximizing shareholder value, which is, is an ideology of, of the market economy, neoclassical economics. The other thing in the, in the, in the paper that I, where I introduced the investment triad is in the context of the Biden administration in the United States uh, having an agenda, which it called broadly the Build Back Better agenda, uh, to in fact uh, invest in productive capabilities. They don't adopt, you know, my approach, um, but uh, that, that it, there's elements there. And uh, one element, which usually has no problems in getting uh, uh, even bipartisan or support in the United States, Republicans and Democrats, is government agencies, investment in infrastructure, uh, knowledge, you know, investment in education, not, not as easy. Uh, but what's also in the Biden administration, but it's totally stalled, is investment in families and household units and in, in allowing people to uh, have uh, productive adults and children that are going into the labor force. But what's almost totally absent, however, is uh, a notion of uh, what business corporations do. Uh, and that's uh, in terms of this process and the need to govern business corporations if this agenda is gonna succeed. And basically in the end, I say that the agenda, I lay out an agenda for uh, governing corporations to invest in productive capabilities and say that if uh, uh, that's not part of the agenda, the other parts of it will fail. That's my argument. Okay, now, next slide, uh, it's not changing so easily here. Try it here. Okay, oops, that was fine. Just a minute, the slide's not. Next, okay. Next, okay. All right. As as macro outcomes, what we're looking for is what I've been calling for a long time sustainable prosperity, stable and equitable economic growth. And most people will probably agree with this generally as uh, that we want a uh, rise in per capita standards of living, uh, per capita uh, productivity that allows higher standards of living. We want employment and income that are stable over time, not that subject to boom or bust and that uh, can be sustained over what now for many people is four decades or more of a working life and two decades or more of retirement. Uh, so this is, this is a big thing to deliver and it's not easy to deliver. We also want it to be equitable and that is that the gains be, uh, of growth be shared fairly uh, by those who contribute to it. Well, that, there's obviously a very subjective notion there about uh, what fair is and who makes the con contribution, but actually that that particularly the contribution part of it is very bound up uh, in economic theory, uh, which is, uh, makes arguments about who actually contributes to creating value in the economy and who gets to extract it. Basically, the maximizing shareholder value argument is that shareholders are the only ones who take risks, the only ones who uh, stand to lose or gain by investing in productivity and productive capabilities, and therefore they should get all the profits. And that's a disastrous point of view, and it's also a totally wrong point of view, as I'll, as I'll state. And also, I, as I say at the bottom there, when I talk about equitable, you can 
extend that to across generations in terms of use of the planet's resources, et cetera. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the United States, the distribution of income is totally inequitable and becoming more and more inequitable over time. And if you believe in that before the pandemic, it's becoming even worse during the pandemic. Uh, this is the Gini coefficient, uh, which is if it was uh, if it was zero, everybody in the economy would have, all families would have the same income. Uh, if it was one, then just one family would have all the income. Nobody would have everybody anything else. Uh, and you can see that there was a trend post World War II uh, into the 1970s toward a more equitable distribution of income, at least it's, uh, the Gini coefficient was uh, as a trend falling. But then uh, around uh, the uh, late 1970s, uh, early 1980s, it just started climbing and climbing and climbing some more. Okay. Now, uh, another picture of this, this comes from the New York Times, and this is from the Piketty Says data, the tax data that they collect from, from the uh, tax authorities in the United States. Uh, that gray line shows the uh, uh, distribution of income across income percentiles, which is the horizontal axis. And uh, the vertical axis is uh, between, in, in this case, 1946 and 1980. Uh, what did each of those percentiles get in terms of percent uh, uh, income growth? And you can see that the lowest percentiles on the left uh, were getting the highest income growth. And on the right, uh, the, uh, up to 1980, for those 34 years, the, uh, the, the richest uh, had less growth. Um, totally different picture if you look from 1980 uh, to 2014, another 34 year period. Uh, it's not only are the uh, lowest levels of percentiles getting the least growth or even no growth in many cases, uh, but uh, you're getting a massive a concentration of the income gains right at the top of the income distribution. Now, one reason for this, and this also comes from the Piketty says data, but it uh, that you couldn't couldn't extend it beyond 2011 in this picture. For some reason, they changed the data where they're collecting the data. But basically what you see here is components of the uh, income of the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of households, uh, richest households in the United States. And uh, you can see some of it is capital gains, some of it is business income, capital income. But what the big increase uh, since uh, the, early, the 1980s has been in what is called salaries. Now uh, that salaries, and you can see the salaries peak at certain points, like in uh, 2000 and 2007, uh, when the stock market is up. Uh, that's because those salaries include uh, stock-based pay. That's what's driving that to become a bigger, bigger portion of, uh, of, of the income of the, of, the, of, the rich, of the rich. It's not their only source of income. Uh, it's not included in capital gains because the stock-based uh, pay uh, uh, as a, of, uh, of executives is taxed at the ordinary income tax rate. And actually on their tax returns, there's a little uh, box where it says uh, wages, tips, you know, which is a particularly American phenomenon, et cetera. Uh, you know, and you put your tips, your $2 tips or your $10 tips, or you put uh, your uh, uh, you know, $10 million uh, stock-based pay realized gains all in the same box. Um, so, so the uh, IRS, at least the data they collect, does not separate out uh, that stock-based pay, but that has become more and more important. Now, this is a, a chart which many of you have probably seen from the Economic Policy Institute, um, uh, where you have rate increase in productivity uh, from uh, the late 40s until uh, 2021. Um, and uh, the, uh, in the, in the post-war II period, in line with what I showed you about a move towards somewhat more equality in uh, income distribution, uh, as productivity went up, uh, wages went up by a similar percentage. And they, so they tracked one another. Uh, but then there was a diversion in the late 70s, early 80s, and it became greater and greater. And uh, uh, it struck me that the, uh, 
the gap looked like the jaws of an alligator. So I stuck an alligator in there and uh, I called it the place where the predators prey because that's basically where a lot of those people are getting rich, but we need to identify why that's the case. Now, here's one way, having pictures of two economists uh, who you may or may not know from their pictures, <coughs> uh, very different explanations of what's going on in these two periods, uh, which explain uh, in the first case, why wages drag productivity, and the second case, why you have uh, productivity just way outpacing wages. So on the left is uh, Edith Penrose, um, a author in 1959 of a, a book, The Theory of the Growth of the Firm. Um, and uh, in that book, she argued that uh, when a corporation grows, it makes use of unused resources. And that means if it's trained people, it doesn't lay off people, it keeps people employed for a career. And in fact, that was the norm. I call the career with one company norm that uh, governed corporations uh, widespread and really almost ubiquitous in the United States uh, until the early 1980s. And I've also called that a retain and reinvest uh, a regime in terms of investment and product, productive capabilities, you retain a good portion of your profits and you reinvest in your productive capabilities, not just plant and equipment, but also people. And people become uh, critical assets to the firm. They're not meant, they're not uh, you know, on balance sheets because you can't own people, but, uh, but companies invested in people through their formal education, uh, uh, formal training, uh, and through on the job experience and they did not fire people and they shared in the productivity gains. Uh, part of this was through unions at the blue collar level, but at the white collar level, it was just done through this, the norm of a career with one company. Uh, that all started falling apart in the early 1980s and uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, this guy, his name is Michael C. Jensen. He came along with the uh, notion that out of the Chicago School by way of the University of Rochester, which is even more conservative than the Chicago School of Economics, uh, arguing uh, that uh, companies should maximize shareholder value. All the money that's in companies should go out in the stock market. He called it disgorging the free cash flow, which are totally ideological terms. Uh, that you're going to disgorge something, somehow it doesn't belong in the companies that it's free. If you can lay off 10,000 people, that's, uh, that's free cash flow. And I call that downsize and distribute. So he becomes the guru of maximizing shareholder value, but it's really uh, posing it as a theory of value creation, that shareholders create value by reallocating resources in the economy, but it's really uh, a theory of downsize and distribute. Uh, interestingly enough, um, well, first of all, Penrose book, I always call it a classic, but, but the definition of one is uh, a book that everybody cites, but few have read, which I think is true of her book. It's very well worth reading. It doesn't tell you everything. The other thing is I got to know her in the early 90s. She passed away in 1996, and uh, she started talking about uh, the theory of the death in the firm, and in a sense, she indirectly met Jensen because uh, the, uh, the article that of mine uh, that she cited, uh, Controlling the Market for Corporate Control, which ultimately appeared in Industrial Corporate Change, was presented at the Harvard Business School at a seminar that I was very much involved with there, with uh, Jensen as discussed 30 years ago, just as a, an aside there, if anybody's interested, as a result of him getting caught at his own home turf as my discussant, uh, without really knowing what I was going to uh, say, uh, he ended up having me banned from Harvard Business School. That's another story. It's actually in, uh, uh, someone published a version of this in, in Newsweek magazine. Okay, uh, this is actually, he, his coming to Harvard Business School had a big impact uh, because it legitimized uh, something that a lot of people were pushing for uh, in the business sector, um, financial interests, and that is, uh, the notion that companies should uh, maximize shareholder value. And so this is from an article that shows hits in the Wall Street Journal really taking off from the mid-1980s. And I believe that it's, as I indicate, those boxes I put in there are uh, because of uh, Harvard Business School legitimizing this ideology. Uh, you also see uh, the uh, box that says SEC Rule 10B18, uh, legalizing large-scale buybacks, uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, my colleague Ken Jacobson is, is listening in and we have a, a paper we've been trying to finish for a long time on the origins of this rule, 
that is really a license to loot that allows companies to do large scale buybacks without being charged with manipulating the market by the Security Exchange Commission in the United States. But in fact, that's what they're doing, manipulating the market. Now, if we look at the US economy as a whole, uh, and these are data just on employment uh, uh, and uh, payroll, et cetera, of uh, firms by, by size, number of employees, there's no getting around the, the fact that the United States is driven by uh, uh, concentration of employees in large scale firms. Um, and uh, so if you take uh, firms with 5,000 or more employees, uh, they are 36% uh, of all paid employees, 41% uh, of payrolls, uh, and they uh, uh, employ, um, sorry for me to see the number here, but uh, um, I think it's, 20, uh, it's covered up by, close this. Anyway, above, I think it's about 20, you can see it, but it's about 20,000 employees. Now, uh, what, those, uh, what those firms do to, uh, um, in terms of resource allocation determines the performance of the economy as a whole. And so the work that we do at AirNet and that I do with many colleagues, and I'll give you some examples of that later on, uh, very briefly because of time constraints, but uh, looks at uh, how these companies operate and whether they are in retain and reinvest mode or downsize and distribute mode. And what we often see is that companies that have become dominant, like Microsoft, Apple, Intel, uh, get into a dominate and distribute mode, although some of the, that can end up leading to downsize and distribute. Uh, we also see actually the reverse, let's say from financialization, downsize and distribute to retain and reinvest in some companies. I'll give you some examples of that. That's not impossible. But the United States has become uh, really a world leader in uh, um, dominate and distribute, downsize, distribute, and maximizing shareholder value. Now, to understand that process of uh, maximizing shareholder value, what you really need to understand is how companies create value. And uh, uh, first of all, there are social organizations that uh, invest in productive capabilities to generate higher quality goods and services. Uh, in existing that are uh, available in existing product markets. Okay, now uh, that's not an easy thing to do. But if a firm can generate what the buyers consider to be higher quality products, it can capture a large market share and through scale economies get a low unit cost. So that's the definition, the economic definition of innovation, uh, generating a higher quality product and getting the scale economies to drive the unit costs down. Um, it can, uh, both of the firm can occur through internal development, merger and acquisition, external collaboration. Um, mergers and acquisitions may be for the purpose of innovation, but they also may be for the purpose of value extraction. That is, you get a hold of uh, another company, you start extracting all its profits. Uh, okay, and fact, but what we find is that firms that go large may turn from innovation and financialization and is mainly manifested by distributions to shareholders in the form of dividends and buybacks. Uh, so then there, that becomes the uh, distribute part of down, dominate and downsize. Uh, you're distributing the cash to shareholders in the form of dividends and buybacks, uh, which I'll come back to in, 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 a, in a few minutes. Um, the uh, And so that's what we mean when we say we're going from innovation to financialization. And the extent of financialization that exists in the US economy could have not occur if there wasn't a lot of innovation prior to it, that a lot of value to be extracted. So it's a rich economy, highly unequal, but has had a history of value creation. Now, this I'll go over real briefly because this is the bigger framework in which we look at uh, the uh, innovative enterprise in terms of uh, operating in terms of strategy, organization, and finance, the institutions of governance, employment, and, and investment that uh, are the context in which it operates. We look at it in different industrial sectors or firms look very different in, in terms of investment and capabilities if they're uh, in, in the fast food market versus the bio, biopharma market, for example. Uh, and that's part of uh, the framework we use in looking at these firms in a broader context. Uh, I won't spend time on that. Uh, what I will say is that 
What's important about innovation is that it's uncertain, collective, and cumulative. And because it's uncertain, you, uh, you have to have strategy at the firm level. Uh, you don't just invest in anything. You have to say, okay, we are going to do create a higher quality product. Um, and But first of all, if you knew it with certainty you could do, it wouldn't be innovation. Uh, when you do it, there has to be some people making that decision in the face of uncertainty. And it's not a matter of uh, you know, risk probability. It is, it is fundamental uncertainty. Uh, innovation is also collective and uh, to, to develop those higher quality products and then get the large market share and drive down unit costs uh, requires getting people learning, working together in organizations. That's what organizations do. And it's also cumulative uh, that it takes time, that, that uh, what you learned yesterday determines what you can learn today. And uh, for that reason, actually, you need finance. You need to finance this process in the firm. So this comes from these uh, characteristics, the innovation process come up <clears throat> with uh, some behavioral notions of, of the firm, uh, strategic control, uh, who is exercising strategic control, making these uh, decisions to invest in the face of uncertainty, uh, how and who do you integrate into uh, 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 the organization, give them relationships, which usually involves sustained employment in the organization or learning within the organization over time, uh, who is involved in that? And what's the source of financial commitment that allows you to sustain this? And as I said before, the fundamental source of financial commitment uh, and uh, in, in, in wherever you look, is the profits that a company has already made. And that's actually the fundamental difference between this point of view and the, so the Jensen point of view, or more generally, the neoclassical point of view. It's assumed that the stock market is a source of funds and uh, that the more money sloshes around through financial markets, the more capital formation will be, which is totally wrong. Now, something else which is totally wrong, which I'll just spend, again, a couple minutes on, is uh, every time uh, your professor or you uh, draw an upward sloping supply curve and it looks so great that you got this equilibrium, uh, uh, you are saying we live in an unproductive economy. Uh, we don't want firms that uh, are constrained in terms of supply by upward sloping supply curves. So I'm assuming all, all the students here have, have studied all this stuff in economics. Uh, we want, we in fact want this equilibrium. We want uh, downward sloping uh, supply curves. Now it may be that some firms can really start to dominate the industry and price gouge, et cetera. Well, then we can deal with that institutionally and there are ways of doing that. But uh, the notion that uh, you want the firm to, <coughs> to uh, or that firms by character have upward sloping supply curves are totally wrong. And, i uh, refer you to this paper, it's been published recently with the title as the unproductive firm, the foundation of the most efficient economy. That's obviously an absurdity, uh, but that's what is argued in all the textbooks, starting with Samuelson's textbook on economics in 1948, and every one that's published now, is that the most unproductive firm is the foundation of the most efficient economy. You know, I'm not going to get into the, all the arguments about this, and that would take too much time too, except to say, that the familiar U-shaped cost curve on the left there, uh, uh, the sooner that cost curve turns up, that average cost starts rising, that, which means the firm's becoming more unproductive as it's expand output. The lower the level of the output, the more firms there are in the industry, given a certain amount of industry output, the more perfect the competition and more efficient the economy. It's a total bunch of crap. It's, it's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. Everybody teaches it as if it's by rote, as, and this becomes the basis of then arguing that uh, the economy is basically the market economy. Uh, the best firms are the ones that are not powerful, that are uh, 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 <clears throat> impotent, and the markets are uh, uh, omnipotent. And uh, in fact, you cannot have innovation without powerful firms. Okay, so that is the argument about the innovating firm. And basically, um, I'm just going to skip through this very quickly. And I don't want to take too much time just going through the, the logic of this. Oops, I have to. Um, because of, oops, oops, this, okay, so important. I don't have too many written. 
Okay, here basically you see it. Basically, uh, the whole point of an innovative firm is to unbend the supply curve. Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, to, to I mean the uh, to to drive down uh, cost. And uh, if you don't have equilibrium, well, then you you know as a well-trained economist, and that's all you know. Well, that's too bad. Uh, but that's because of the nature of innovation. And uh, that's what we need to understand. And to understand that, you have to then study how firms actually operate. Uh, on the, on the, in terms of markets, uh, uh, <clears throat> many firms enter in advanced countries uh, through uh, uh, with a very high income price and sensitive markets like the military or and others, and then develop the products to get into uh, market segments where when they get to low income <clears throat> price sensitive markets, they become commodities. In developing countries, it tends to often work the other way. They come in through products, process innovation and move up to more sophisticated products. Again, that's just to give you a, a flavor of, of, of what this is uh, arguing. Now, when you have uh, innovative enterprise, you have new sources of value which are embodied in higher quality, lower cost products and make it possible when only means inevitable for all participants in the economy to gain simultaneously. And so here I lay out those who can gain. And what you're really talking about is value creation and value extraction. Who creates value, who extracts value. Uh, and the, the critical issue for income distribution, which I think most economists just completely cannot get because they just think of the market as determining income distribution, is what goes on within firms and particularly these major firms. Now, <clears throat> here's a book which I came out with a colleague, Jags of Shin, uh, uh, almost three years ago now, just as the pandemic was coming upon us, in which we lay out the uh, uh, notion of the U.S. as a value extracting economy, call it predatory value extraction, how the looting of the business corporation became the U.S. norm, and how sustainable prosperity could be restored. Okay, and uh, this, in many ways, the paper is an elaboration of a lot of these ideas. Um, Basically, what you have is when you have a successful firm like a company like Apple, and I'll give you an example of Apple in a minute, you have a huge pot of gold in terms of product uh, profits uh, that can be shared equitably or that can be grabbed inequitably. And what's happened in the United States is it's grabbed inequitably uh, they got, through lobbying for lower tax rates, through not giving wages to workers, laying off workers, uh, looking for lower wage workers, uh, and but more importantly, at the other end, through distribution to shareholders, uh, particularly in the form of stock buybacks um, in, on top of dividends. Um, and it's all been legitimized, going back to Jensen, as, an, uh, as value creation, this is what efficient economy does, but it's based on a theory of the most inefficient firm as the foundation of the most efficient economy. But it's an ideology, not surprisingly, of value extraction that is just posing as a theory of value creation. Now, in uh, that book, we talk about the uh, value extracting insiders, the senior executives with their stock based pay incentivized to do uh, uh, to downsize and distribute. We talk about the enablers, institutional investors, uh, also always wanting to get a higher yield on their portfolios and uh, looking uh, uh, in, in, at increasingly. Uh, to value extracting outsiders, hedge fund activists who actually with very small shares of companies can go in, tear them apart and get higher yields uh, for a time, at least uh, for the pension funds and others that are participating with them. And then with the cooperation uh, generally of uh, top management who don't and no longer see them as hostile. It's all part of this uh, value extracting process. Uh, here's just some data, which Matt Hopkins is also, uh, I'm not sure he's on this uh, uh, with us now, but he uh, had pulled out from the executive comp on the stock based pay of uh, the 500 highest paid executive in each year from 2006 to 2021. And you can see the average pay that's $47.4 million uh, in 2021. And that's excluding someone like Elon Musk, who would just totally skew the thing. I think it was about, you know, about 2.3 billion or 23 billion, something ridiculous. But in any case, the uh, kind of uh, turquoise and purple uh, parts of those bars, that's all stock-based pay. And that, you get the stock price up, you get, uh, you get higher. Pay. The smaller and smaller number of <laughs> asset managers are controlling uh, the, uh, the shares of 
uh, that are on the market and uh, they are uh, being lined up by these uh, the under people underlined are these shareholder activists among the hedge funds uh, who uh, come in and get their proxy votes and then are able with maybe 1% of the shares of a company uh, change who's the management and start doing more distribution to shareholders. I'll just stop here for a second to say that the impact of our book, um, Predatory Value Correction, even though some of my work has had a lot of, uh, um, let's say, airplay from stuff on stock buybacks, particularly subsequent to a Harvard Business Review article I published in 2014. Uh, so it's not that my work doesn't have visibility on this in the United States, a lot of media citations, et cetera. But the book itself is just we widely ignored. I think maybe just too hard for, you know, some people understand for her. Uh, but here, here's one source of impact. Uh, this is an article by Joe Biden, President of the United States, when he was vice president in the Wall Street Journal in uh, September of 2016. And he had been a fan of this article that I had written in Harvard Business Review. I had met him a couple of times in 2015 to discuss it. And uh, I'm actually in this article, which is all about the need to get rid of buybacks and its relation to executive pay. Uh, he uh, says, according to William Wozonic and the economist uh, William Wozonic, he gives uh, data from that Harvard Business Review article. Um, I went to look at it about uh, 18 months ago. Uh, someone asked me about Biden. Why isn't he talking about buybacks? I said he was. Here's here's his article, and I saw it. It said, according to Wozonic blank space comma, uh, someone uh, I think in his administration had somehow gotten hacked into the Wall Street Journal and taken my name out. Uh, anyway, now it's back in um, uh, because I, I contacted some people there. Uh, but you know that's, that's the biggest impact I can see it having is people needing to remove my name from Joe Biden's uh, op-ed. Okay, now uh, let me just quickly say that the flaws in shareholder value ideology uh, it's the assumption that only shareholders take risk and therefore if profits or losses occur, they either have to bear them or they, uh, the losses get the profits. Taxpayers, we always take risks because we make investments and the companies may not generate the revenues uh, using our knowledge and infrastructure that can return that value to us. And then of course, politically, they might try to get the tax rate down. We take that risk as well. Um, uh, as uh, workers take risks because workers are uh, constantly uh, uh, working for companies and uh, you know you don't just work for you know the pay you can get this year if actually if you're really a worthwhile worker if they're investment in your productive capabilities you need a career um, but you can be fired and so you, your, your returns aren't guaranteed so it's just a total myth of the market economy that comes out of neoclassical economics and shareholder value. In fact, public shareholders take almost no risk because at a click of a mouse, you can just sell your shares and you have limited liability. And of course, uh, that uh, risk is even uh, less because the companies are disgorging so-called the free cash flow uh, to shareholders and, and giving them the, all the yields that belong to everybody else. Uh, so this whole ideology is very destructive of strategic control organizational integration, financial commitment, strategic control, because you have the people at the top who don't care about innovation. They compare, compare about getting the stock price up. Uh, it undermines the organizational learning process in companies. Uh, and we've documented that in many, many different play, uh, studies. And it drains the form of financial commitment uh, that uh, comes fundamentally from um, uh, retained earnings. Um, let me get to uh, some issues of, uh, well, I'll give you the example uh, of the stock market not being a fund of, uh, source of capital. Um, Apple, uh, which of course one of the most successful companies in history, uh, has between October 2012 and June of 2022, spent uh, $529 billion buying back its own stock along with $118 billion in dividends. And they call it their capital return program. Uh, but the only funds that Apple ever got from public shareholders was $97 million in its 1980 IPO. So what kind of capital return uh, is this? And in fact, it's not capital, it's finance. Everybody uses the term capital one, which is a stock, not a flow. 
Okay, they're not returning. They're just that uh, you can, as a saver, uh, have a share, buy shares in the company. And if they have money available, traditionally they would pay you dividends and they pay those to all shareholders. But what's new since the 1980s is the stock buybacks, which is just manipulating the stock price. And it's not everybody who gains from stock buybacks. It's the people who are in the business of buying and selling shares. Now, one of those, and we've written a long article which documents how uh, Carl Icahn, a well-known shareholder activist from the 70s into the present, uh, uh, may, uh, gained uh, $2 billion from $3.6 billion in Apple shares that he had bought 30 months uh, earlier. Um, now, he did not, not, not one cent of that $3.6 billion went to Apple, it just went to other shareholders. But during the two years uh, plus that he held shares, Apple did record buy buybacks for the time. And, and he then uh, actually had some inside information for the particular timing of the sale. Now, uh, as he was selling, uh, someone who's well known and seen as a patient capitalist, but I think uh, this shows that he, he, what that doesn't really mean very much is Warren Buffett, because he took uh, from Berkshire Hathaway, uh, uh, the company that he controls, uh, 10 times what Icon had put into Apple shares, again, buying them on the market. Uh, and he had over 5% of the uh, Apple shares, which is a big, big amount. Uh, and he, uh, in an interview, as he was buying up these shares, he is delighted to see Apple repurchasing shares of all the idea of our 5%, whatever it is, maybe grow to 6 or 7% without our laying out a dime. What, 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 what a confession of extraction, of just total value extraction. It has nothing to do with, with anything. Not one cent of those $36.3 billion went to Apple. But uh, while he was uh, doing, uh, uh, holding these shares, you can see the numbers there. Apple repurchased 33 billion, 72 billion, 67 billion, 86 billion. And now they're probably on track to even beat, beat the 86 billion in 2022. Uh, those are massive amounts that are propping up the value of the shares. As a result, this is about last January, we looked at it on that uh, $36 billion um, that was just money put into shares that are outstanding, uh, Buffett had uh, gained about uh, uh, about 120 billion. Uh, so that's where that income distribution inequality is coming from. Um, and again, not one cent of anything that he put into Apple uh, was, uh, um, uh, that he put into Apple shares went to Apple's productive capabilities. Okay, now, what enables this is, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the, a rule that was passed under the radar with virtually no comment uh, uh, called Rule 10B18, the one Wall Street Journal article that exists on it, or one media article is Wall Street Journal. Actually, as you can see, it says agencies assure it won't file charges of manipulation if certain rules are met as it eases stuff, repurchases. And in fact, the, the buybacks are seen by the SEC as repurchases. It just says you can loot the company and we won't call it, we won't, we won't uh, have manipulation charges. And so if we take the same company from uh, companies from uh, uh, these are 216 companies from 1981 to uh, 2019, and uh, uh, we see that at the beginning of the period, just before and after Rule 10 B18, hardly any of the yield uh, the distribution for buybacks. Uh, the dividends are about the same as a portion of net income, uh, but the buybacks are, are even greater. And so this is what's been added. This is not one or the other, it's both. Um, and here is uh, uh, the 20 largest repurchasers, uh, 2010-2019, and then uh, through the end of 2021, uh, I was tracking the data uh, on on their you know during the pandemic uh, their buybacks. Uh, I, I'll give you some just some examples from these, but the, these are the companies that really are setting the trend in terms of getting their stock prices up. And of course, when Apple does all these buybacks, it doesn't mean it's running out of money with 530 billion of buybacks since uh, 2012 uh, because it remains profitable, uh, highly profitable, but it does set the bar high. For everybody else, and it keeps the stock price up, and everybody's competing uh, to get their stock price up. And the fact is that most buybacks are done when stock prices are high, not when they're low. So the companies aren't getting bargains by buying back their stock. They're, in fact, paying high prices to boost their stock price even more. 
uh, as uh, Aaron Sankic and uh, Matt Hopkins and I wrote in Wall Street in the Harvard Business Review in uh, uh, about three years ago, uh, a lot of this is being funded by debt. So companies are, do, are, are are taking on debt, and this was particularly in the era of quantitative easing, low interest rates to, uh, to, to do buybacks. Um, in the pandemic, we've gone through companies that stopped doing buybacks, those that started doing buybacks, I don't really have time to go through them. I'll just give you some examples. Now, Marie Carpenter was also with us, and I have finished a paper, we haven't released it yet, but it's, it's on Cisco Systems, how Cisco Systems uh, was a highly innovative company in the in, in, in enterprise networking in the 1990s, uh, but uh, and then had a soaring stock price, the highest market capitalization of any company in the world in March of, uh, like, uh, of 2000. Uh, but then its stock price plummeted, not so much that its revenues plummeted, it, uh, it plummeted because the stock market plummeted, and then it started doing buybacks. And it spent over 100% of its profits since then, plus dividends uh, uh, and distribution to shareholders, and become a totally in an uninnovative company. It's not just because of the money going out, it's because of the kinds of people who are running the company. In fact, the person who was good at building the company up uh, in the, the 1990s, or at least getting it to a, a large market share, and the guy named John Chambers remained the CEO, and he was totally incapable of taking uh cisco to a new uh uh to be a competitor basically in higher quality markets which would uh be cisco could have been huawei for example or could have been uh competing with ericsson or or, or nokia uh but they're not and uh they have they're big and they're still big in enterprise networking but they're an innovative company uh which is in a kind of dominate and distribute mode uh we have the example of General Electric, which is, torn, is an example of being torn apart by uh, a hedge fund activist, uh, Nelson Peltz, it should be three and partners, uh, who never had more than 9.9, less than 1% of the GE shares, uh, but uh, got them to do massive buybacks and dividends actually tore the company apart. Now they're breaking up the company into three parts uh, to try to make money for this uh, hedge fund activist and lots of other big shareholders. Uh, uh, Erdem and, and I have uh, wrote an article on uh, Boeing and how their buybacks were part of the process of just pumping up their stock price when they knew, knew they were selling an unsafe plane leading up to the week before uh, uh, the 737 MAX crashes. And in fact, uh, that has been made into a, uh, uh, it's part of a serial on US television on CSN. CNBC called American Greed, and they did a pretty good job of taking uh, the arguments in our article and turning it into a 45-minute uh, uh, documentary uh, on uh, uh, Boeing and buybacks and, and, and executive pay and uh, ignoring uh, the fact that they were making all this money that was allowing them to do the buybacks uh, on, by selling unsafe planes. Uh, it can go the other direction. We have an, uh, pay, uh, a book coming out with uh, Antonio Andreoni and Owner Tool, and maybe the word research done by Owner, on uh, big pharma in the UK, AstraZeneca, Glasgow, Smith Klein, going from innovation to financialization. Okay. Um, the, uh, there have been cases in the US of companies uh, stopping to do buybacks, and it's actually proof of the argument we're making that they undermine innovation when they need to do innovation. Uh, Pfizer is one of them, and this is before it made the bonanza uh, with the BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine. Uh, they had been one of the most financialized companies in the United States, uh, doing acquisitions of the other big pharma companies and then using the patents and milking them dry to pump up their stock price. But that the, the, the companies that they acquired, the blockbuster drugs, the uh, and, uh, had, had disappeared, the patents were expiring, so they knew they had to invest in the pipeline, so they stopped doing buybacks. Uh, they started doing them a little bit again since they made all that money from the vaccine, but now they're recognizing that that with bananas it might not exist uh, for very long. Uh, Intel is another company that was highly financialized, doing lots and lots of buybacks, falling behind the rest of the world in terms of, in particularly the Taiwanese and, and Koreans in terms of semiconductor fabrication. Uh, but they uh, then uh, made a switch 
in uh, February 2021 to a production guy, Gelsinger from a, a financial guy, Swan. And this was uh, Gelsinger uh, stated several times in several contexts that uh, they're not going to do any more stock buybacks, that they're going to invest. Uh, so it's kind of from the horse's mouth say, saying, we're not going to do that stuff. We're going to actually invest the company. And it's not just the money. It's that if you have people who are focused on getting the stock price up, you don't think of how, not just investing in your factories, but how we, to getting, as he put it, the cycle of momentum going, the factory teams executing better. You don't have people who understand what, technology is there and how to use it and how you can get, you know, from a 10 nanometer process to a seven to a five nanometer process, which uh, Intel is struggling to do. Now, maybe they'll solve that problem and maybe they won't. Okay, finally, let me end uh, just with briefly the, uh, the reform agenda that again is, is in the book, uh, but uh, different things are emphasized here and then also in the context of the Biden administration, uh, which was not um, uh, in power in, in January 2020, unfortunately, uh, uh, when we when we wrote that book. But now it, it is it is agenda that can be taken on and uh, show to a limited extent. At least it's it, it, we've had some some influence on uh, on on prospective legislation. One is to get rid of this road to MB18, and so that. Uh, any company that does large-scale buybacks like Apple, uh, they'd be charged with manipulation charges. Uh, it would probably crash the stock market, but you know sometimes that's what you have to do in order to uh, get back on track. That might not be a bad idea. Uh, the second is get executive pay, untie it to uh, stock-based pay, uh, incentivize uh, executives to invest in innovation, invest in profit capabilities, rather than now, which is to incentivize them to downside distribute, uh, fix the corporate tax system so it rewards value creation uh, and penalizes value extraction, uh, put workers on, on boards, uh, worker representatives, uh, and exclude the predatory value extractors, a Carl Icahn, Nelson Peltz, Paul Singer. They should not be not allowed anywhere near a corporate board. Of course, now they, they, they come in with 1% of the shares and dominate them. And then make sure that through the investment triad, we have investment constructive capabilities so that in the economy and society, uh, they can support collective and cumulative careers and restore socioeconomic mobility, upper mobility uh, for US households. And uh, a lot of this can be done by in the context of responding to pathogen pandemics or climate change. Now, just a bit, uh, uh, there, uh, a senator from Wisconsin, Hemi Baldwin, uh, several years ago took up these ideas and has legislation called the Reward Work Act, uh, which would uh, get rid of Rule 10B18 and put have all publicly listed companies have a third of their board members uh, be uh, employee representatives. This has uh, just been reintroduced in the House of Representatives of the United States, uh, just, uh, I said, less, less than exactly one week ago, uh, the Reward Work Act to rein in stock buybacks um, uh, uh, and uh, put workers on boards. Um, uh, Elizabeth Warren has also uh, something which I had some input into. Uh, uh, legislation which would change the charter from a state to a national charter for the largest corporation. The part of that was having workers on boards and limiting what uh, companies could pay out to shareholders. Um, the, uh, we're not there yet because uh, some well-intentioned uh, progressives uh, in, in U.S. Congress, and here there are two Sherrod Brown is a senator in Ohio, Juan Ryden is a senator in Oregon. They're labor supporters, they're progressives, and I think they're in a general sense. But they came up with this, or their staff, with a stupid scheme to tax buybacks at 2%. Uh, and I was immediately, when I saw this, I said, this is ridiculous. It's just going to uh, legitimize buybacks. And uh, so I said, uh, and I write in the paper, they should. I have a uh, tax of at least 40%, like cigarettes, maybe 50%. And with a warning on banner on the corporate repurchasers website that reads, stock buybacks destroy the middle class. So if you want to do buybacks, you're going to pay 40, 50% tax, and you're going to have to have this banner on your website. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that will happen, but here's what did happen, uh, which is kind of interesting. They just had the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the latest legislation. 
of the Biden administration or through in, in August. And uh, there's a particular senator in the, in the Democrats who you know, have a, a raised with in a uh, majority uh, in, uh, in the Senate uh, named Kristen Sinema, who is always causing trouble. And uh, they wanted to get rid of uh, a tax loophole for hedge fund activists where they pay a capital gains tax rate and lower, lower rate than the personal tax rate. Uh, she said she would not vote along with them and would kill the whole bill. Uh, uh, if uh, they push this because uh, her donors didn't, didn't like that uh, being taxed at a higher rate. So she suggested that they put a 1% tax in actually once the White House had already cut that 2% to 1% on their, their, on their website. And she said, put that in there and you'll get $74 billion. And to his credit, uh, Chuck Schumer, who's a, the Democratic majority leader, uh, he basically said, he was forced to do this because to get her vote. But he also said uh, he hates buybacks. He thinks that the most self-serving, despicable things that America, corporate America does, uh, they're despicable, I'd like to abolish them. So maybe that might happen. Finally, uh, Biden, uh, I wrote this article uh, last, uh, I think February, January, February, uh, I guess in March, beginning of March after Biden, uh, president gave a State of the Union address and uh, it's online at, on INET website, the Institute for Economic Thinking, uh, where he had been this big supporter of, of uh, being, a, you know, a big opponent of buybacks. And, and, and as you saw with the, that uh, Wall Street Journal article, uh, but he hadn't really said hardly anything about them as president. I think this was suppressed by the same people who took my name out of the, uh, the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, and so when he had his State of the Union address, he never mentioned the problem of corporate financialization buyback. So I rewrote the address. You can go read it. I had fun doing it. I went through the address and I acted as uh, his speechwriter and I inserted a whole bunch of places based on what he had said before on places where he could have said, uh, and we should get into the buybacks, et cetera. So I called that, where did you go, Vice President Joe? And with that, I'll, I'll end uh, what I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh...